Hey fans of Biblical Genetics, this is Dr. Rob. I'm coming at you today from Washington, D.C. I had an opportunity after a tour of a couple of churches in this area to take the day. I've been exploring, wandering on it. I've never actually been here before, and this is a joy and a delight. I'm sitting in front of the reflecting pool, the World War II memorials over here. I just walked past 900,000 little white flags, uh, one flag for each person who's died of COVID-19. I've been people watching all day. I love people watching. I've seen people from all different nationalities, races, colors, creeds, you name it, they're here. And it is just a fascinating thing to consider humanity, who we are, what we are, where we came from. But I want to continue my series that I've been doing on the Jewish nation. I tried to get into the Holocaust Museum, not realizing I would need a ticket about a month out, so I wasn't able to go there. One of my recent episodes was on the inbreeding within the early Israelite population. After that, I did an episode on how many times in the Bible Jewish people married non-Jewish people. And I want to take that idea that we have initially an inbred population that then outbred with all the people around them and talk about the genetics of the Jewish race. Are they different? Are they special? Is there a Jewish gene? Can we identify Jewish people based on their DNA? Those are excellent questions and we have a model population here because we have a very good history of the Jews of today. We know where they came from, we know how they were founded, and things like that. So this is a genetic question that we can address. It's very, very interesting. However, the genetics of modern day Jews is going to be overwhelmed by recent events. It's gonna be very difficult to get down into ancient history and say, you know, is this Abraham's Y chromosome? Is that Jacob's Y chromosome? Because when you have a population that has intermarried with a lot of other people and a population that has gone through population bottlenecks from time to time, well, random events tend to dominate. And if just at random, one of the founders of the post-Jewish bottleneck population had a different set of genetics than Jacob's genetics, that person might dominate today. It's even possible that Jacob's Y chromosome is completely lost. I don't think so, but mathematically and statistically it is possible. So we have to walk through this carefully. If you just consider where Jewish colonies popped up in history, we have Jewish people living in Africa, all the way across North Africa, Algeria, Libya, Morocco, Tunisia, down into Egypt, Ethiopia, and way down into Southeast Africa. There are Jewish people popping up in Asia, Asia Minor, that's modern day Turkey, the Levant, which is Israel, uh, Syria, Lebanon, that area. Uh, Yemen, in fact, the Yemeni Jewish population is one of the oldest ones. Baghdad, Iran, India, even as far as Burma. Now, the Burma population, they followed the colonial trading routes. It's one of the more recent populations, but they did get that far in this Jewish community there, at least there was. In Europe, we have Jewish people living in Spain, Italy, Sicily, and the Italian Jews are mentioned in the Bible, so we know they were living there. But all the way across um, the northern Mediterranean, up into Central Europe, these people are really interesting. Are they consistently similar in their genes? That's an honest question, and we can answer that question now with modern genetics. But amongst these many different populations, some were founded by few individuals, some were founded by many individuals. Some were subjected to influxes of other individuals, like when Ferdinand and Isabella kicked out the Jews from Spain in 1492. Well, a lot of those Jewish people that didn't want to convert and didn't want to die, they went to North Africa and brought a huge influx of, of Sephardic DNA into the North African Jewish population. Some of these populations, they remained small for a long time and some of them grew, but in each one of the populations, there is evidence of what's called endogamy. That is, people only interbreeding with people from their local population. So we can see characteristic groups of letters in the genomes of, let's say, the Jews of Algeria versus the Jews of Yemen. So endogamy is a natural thing that pops up when you have an isolated community where people are marrying people from within that community mainly. If you look at the Y chromosomes, we find that Jewish men from around the world contain a diversity of Y chromosomes, not just one, but many. We're talking about group J, group E1B1A, E1B1B. One of those is a 95% of African men belong to that group. R1A, in fact, 30% of Ashkenazi men belong to group R1A, which is associated with um, Southern Asia, mainly. R1B, 
R I have an R1B. R1B is 80% of Western European men belong to that group, and a lot of uh, Jewish men also. Group Q, which is strongly associated with Native Americans. Group I, Group G. So we see that there's a lot of different Y chromosomes within Judaism. That should not be a surprise considering my last episode and my article on creation.com documenting how many times we see people from outside of Israel intermarrying with an Israelite. Lots of Y chromosomes should have bled into the population just like the Jewish Y chromosome should have bled out of the population. I mean, consider um, the, the sons of Abraham from Keturah that he sent to Arabia or consider when the northern tribes of Israel were destroyed and spread out across the Assyrian Empire. Well, that brought all those Y chromosomes across a vast swath, a vast swath of the Middle East. So we don't expect a specific Y chromosome or specific letter even to say this is a Jewish person. You can't do that. But statistically, you can say these are more common. Therefore, it's more likely that these genes belong to the original Jewish population. Now within that Y chromosome, there's a very interesting specific Y chromosome. It's called the Cohen modal haplotype. It's a Y chromosome that's found very commonly in men who belong to families with last names of like Cohen and Khan. These are men who claim that they've inherited the priesthood. They're descendants of Aaron, the high priest. They claim. Now, this Y chromosome is found outside of Israel, rarely, amongst other is, uh, Jewish men, rarely, but it's very common amongst this particular group of men who claim to be priests, essentially, at least descendants of the priests. Now, is it true that this is Aaron's Y chromosome? If so, that's amazing. Statistically, maybe, maybe not, because when that population collapsed, if any person was in there who maybe lied about his parentage for you know, political or cultural advancement, because if you claim to be a, a priest or a Levite, you're a special person. Or maybe there was an affair or a rape or maybe an adoption. Or consider the Samaritans. There are not many Samaritans left in the world now, but they have a priestly family. And there's a Cohen priestly family, except they belong to group E, not group J. So if, say, the Samaritans grew and grew and grew into a large population, well, in the future, their priestly clan would belong to a different priestly clan than the Cohen modal haplotype. Is that because someone lied or is it a mistake or an adoption or just random chance? I don't know. But I'm just trying to illustrate to say that just because a huge group of these Jewish men have that Y chromosome doesn't mean that is Aaron's Y chromosome. It is likely, however, because of history. Cool. There's another group of um, Jewish people that aren't really Jewish. They're the Lemba. They live in southernmost Africa, Southeast Africa. Their history says that they were formed when a ship carrying Jewish sailors got marooned on the coast of southernmost Africa and they couldn't get back home so they intermarried with the local girls and they became the Lemba. They have strange dietary habits. They have a Ark of the Covenant sort of a thing. They have a priestly class. And very interestingly, when they looked at the genetics of this group, because I mean, almost no one believed that they're actually Jewish. Well, the mitochondria were Bantu. The mitochondrial lineages from the ladies belong to Southern Africans. Okay. But many of the Y chromosomes of this family, of this tribe, belong to the Middle East. And some of them, specifically the ones with the priestly duties, have the Cohen modal haplotype. So it might be that not only did a group of Jewish sailors really did get marooned in southernmost Africa, but it might be that a descendant of Aaron, the high priest, was among them. Looking at the mitochondria, though, we get a little different picture. Now, about half of the mitochondria of Ashkenazi women, those are Jews from Eastern Europe, belong to three different females that come from group K. That's a very interesting founder effect. I mean, half of that population goes back to three very closely related women, but that also means that about half, a little less than half, don't belong to that group. The next most common group is group H, which is the most common mitochondria in Europe. I have H16, 
So I, I'm a typical European male because of my Y chromosome and my mitochondria. But a lot of Ashkenazi Jews also belong to group H. So does that mean that they're European? Not necessarily, because just like the Y chromosomes, the mitochondrial lines, they branch very early in the tree. Yes, these things are found in Europe, but the ones found in Europe are newer than the ones typically found amongst the Jewish people. So it doesn't look like they are European, it looks like they're Middle Eastern. Specifically, if you consider the Y chromosomes, the Y chromosome branches are associated with the Middle East. It really does look like they're Middle Eastern people. Also, when you look at the different Jewish groups, they're more similar to each other, spread across the entire range of where they live, than those groups are to the people amongst whom they live. Now, clearly there have been interbreeding events. I mean, the, the Jews of Ethiopia, they have dark skin. Most of them have moved to Israel now, and they've been accepted in Israel as Jewish people because they were practicing Jews. The genetics really doesn't reflect Middle East so much, but it might be because after so many generations, they, you know, they, um, the Middle Eastern genes got diluted in the population and possibly lost. Or it might be that they're a bunch of converts. Oh, interestingly, there is a very controversial claim that the Ashkenazi Jews came from a mass conversion to Judaism within the Khazar Empire. Of, um, the Khazars were a Turkic group living in West Central Asia, like north of the Black Sea in the steppes in the grasslands. And so the claim for a lot of people is that, oh, the Jews are just these people. And there's one genetic claim where they looked at a whole bunch of different peoples and they said, okay, look, these Jewish people, the Ashkenazis, they do look like our test population. The test population they chose was from the Republic of Georgia, south of the Caucasus Mountains. The Khazar, they lived north of the Caucasus Mountains and the Caucasus are a gigantic geographic barrier. But because the statistics indicated that the Jews are more similar to this Georgian population, they claim, look at that, there's evidence that the Khazar theory really is true. Only it's not. Because if you look at the Georgian population today, they're more similar to the Middle Eastern peoples than they are to Asian peoples. Therefore, in that test, they chose the wrong population. Of course, that population is more similar to Jewish people because Jewish people are more similar to Middle Easterners, just like the Georgians. The Khazar Empire is gone. These people have migrated, they died, they interbred with other people. There's no way you can actually genetically pin it to that group because those people aren't there anymore. And this paper chose the wrong test population. There's no evidence that Jewish people, the Ashkenazis at least, came from the Khazars. There's none. Maybe some of the Khazars did convert, maybe, uh, but genetically the Jewish people really do trace back to the Middle East. And why would we think otherwise? The Bible is clear where they came from. We have the history of these people. We have history after the fact, during the, um, the intertestamental period, during the Roman times. They followed the trade routes for the Phoenician Empire and later on during the European colonial times. We know where they came from. This is not a big mystery. You know, I always have trouble wrapping up these episodes. I never know how to conclude because I just like to talk and ramble. And when I get to the end, I'm like, what was I going to say for the end? So let's just say it this way. The Jewish people, we know where they came from. We know where they came from historically, biblically, and genetically. They are a Middle Eastern people group, as expected. They have a lot of genes from the Middle East, as expected. They're not one single group because we know that they interbred with others. We also know that as they spread out, they did intermingle with the people amongst whom they lived, but not to the point where they lost their Middle Eastern roots. Hey, you be blessed and you have an awesome day. It's starting to rain, so I gotta close up shop, put my camera away, but I'm gonna walk around here the rest of the day, see what I can see. I'm probably gonna get soaked, but it's okay, because this is one of the coolest places I've ever been. Washington, D.C. is amazing. It's not nearly as crowded as I thought. There are not many benches. I had to look hard and long to find one, um, but it's a great place for people watching and a great place for history. In fact, I'm heading over to Smithsonian right now. I'm gonna to try to find 
my grandfather's invention, which is in the Smithsonian. I don't know if we'll find it or not, but I'm going to look. Okay, I'll let you go with that, but I do want to thank my supporters. If you'd like to become a supporter of Biblical Genetics, it's really easy. Go to patreon.com and sign up there. I've had a lot of people do so already. I have three different tiers of support. Uh, Dave H, M. Matsky, and Rob S are at my top level. Daniel P, James R, Jeff V, D, and Mark K at my middle level. Mike from Australia, Chris R, who's also from Australia, Jonathan P, and Ted H at my lower level. Or you can go to buymeacoffee.com if you want to just drop a couple dollars in my hat and just say, hey, thanks, Carter. I appreciate what you're doing. I've got uh, Stephanie S this month, Braden B, Louis P, George B, Delane H, a Dina or a Dinah, and two or three anonymous people this month. Thank you so much. I would be nowhere without you. I really appreciate your support.